Thank you for attending Just Recovery Simcoe's All Candidates meeting for Simcoe Gray. My name is Ian Adams and I'm a reporter with Simcoe.com and the State of Wasaga Sun. For this debate, several community groups are participating to host this debate, including Simcoe County Greenbelt Coalition, Simcoe County Alliance to End Homelessness, Contact Community Services, the Climate Action Teams for Wasaga Beach, Collingwood and New Tecumseh, uh, Protect the Escarpment, Aware Simcoe, Simcoe County Environmental Youth Alliance, sorry, and the Reform Gravel Mining Coalition. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional indigenous territories we are situated in. We are gathering in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek people. Locally, we would like to honor the Chippewas Tri-Council, Rama First Nation, Georgina Island First Nation, and Beausoleil Island First Nation, and acknowledge that their ancestors were first stewards of these lands. Via the Williams Treaty and others, agreements were made that lands were meant to be shared and in a way that honors nature and the life that we have been given. History and present day issues clearly demonstrate that we are not living up to this intention or promise. To have hope for future generations, we must recognize the value in each other, reconcile for past and ongoing tragedies, and ensure compassionate care and concern for all. Further, we must recognize that the various components of our ecosystem, air, land, water, flora, and fauna, are all interdependent and need to work in harmony. The only way forward is together. As potential members of provincial parliament, we ask our candidates to uphold choices and policies that address truth and reconciliation in a genuine way. Just Recovery Simcoe has organized debates for the ridings in Simcoe County, Barry and Aurelia, because the outcome of this election will set the course for Ontario for years to come. With growing social in inequity and the climate crisis, Just Recovery Simcoe wanted to present a debate focused on these issues and the solutions, sorry, that parties are offering. This is an opportunity for the candidates to take this matter seriously and advocate at the provincial level on behalf of the environment and acknowledge the social determinants of health. The four candidates invited to today's events, at today's event represent the four parties which have seats at, the Queen, at Queen's Park, the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario, the Liberal Party of Ontario, the Ontario New Democratic Party, and the Ontario Green Party. Now we only have two candidates who have uh, indicated they are participating today. Ted Chrysler of the Ontario Liberal Party and Alan Kuhn of the Ontario Green Party. The structure for today's meeting will be each candidate will be asked to answer preset questions that were shared with candidates prior to the debate. The first round of questions is a rapid fire where candidates will only be able to answer in a set yes, no, unsure, with either a thumbs up for yes, thumbs up for no, and a sideways thumbs for unsure. And I just see that uh, Keith Nunn of the NDP is joining us. Thank you very much for coming on board today, Keith. Following the rapid fire round, the candidates will be asked a series, a series of more in-depth questions. We will then select questions from the audience. To submit a question, please use the Q&A feature in the menu Questions must be addressed to all candidates, be respectful, and pertain to the concerns of the debate. For each question, candidates will have one and a half minutes to respond. Candidates will be alerted with a tone when they have 10 seconds remaining in their time. Once the time has expired, the candidate will be muted, and I will turn the floor over to the next candidate. Before, before the meeting, organizers randomly selected the order for candidates to respond to questions. Once each candidate has responded to a question, the candidates will be asked if they would like to offer a rebuttal. Each candidate has two rebuttal opportunities that they can use at any point during today's debate, but only once per question. Each candidate will be given two minutes for a rebuttal. Finally, we urge each of you to encourage others to vote and put the health and well being of our communities and the planet at the forefront of your decision. This meeting is being recorded, and the final video will be recorded available on Just Recovery Simcoe's YouTube channel. Thank you to all the candidates for their community service and we wish them the best in their campaigns. So we're going to start first with introduction where each candidate will have one minute. 
And the order, uh, we'll start with Ted Chrysler. Hi, I'm Ted Chrysler, the Ontario Liberal candidate for Simcoe Gray. I was born and raised in Collingwood and Mississauga Beach and have deep roots in the riding. I was upset at the policies that Doug Ford and the Conservatives have been pursuing over the past four years and decided it was time to get involved and run for the Liberals in Simcoe Gray. I'm ready to listen and to work hard for our community. Specifically, I'd like to see progress on these areas, making life more affordable, strengthening health care, improving mental health, ensuring strong public education, and creating a greener Ontario. With my counterparts from the NDP and Green Party, there's probably more that we have in common than divides us in many of these areas, and I'm looking forward to discussing these important issues today. Got a mute button. Thanks very much, Ted. Uh, we'll next move on to Alan Kuhn from the Green Party. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alan Kuhn. Um, personally, I am a developmental service worker. I work with adults in, with developmental disabilities in a market garden setting and we uh, grow five acres of organic vegetables. Um, the reason I decided to get involved was I was realizing, uh, watching the, uh, the chaos in Ottawa unfold, that our system, our system is becoming polarized. And I feel that I'm a great candidate and a great person to bring parties together and all parties, because the problems that we're facing are incredible. The problems that are out there right now and are affecting us day to day, mental health, housing, climate change, these things need to be addressed and we can't squabble anymore. There's no more time. So I'm here because of urgency and I'm here because this is my passion. So I appreciate everything that Just Recovery has done and I really appreciate everyone who showed up today. This is awesome, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, and least, last but not least, uh, representing the New Democratic Party, Keith Nunn. Go ahead, Keith. Hello, uh, my name's Keith Nunn, and uh, I am a small town boy uh, of many years, um, though I have uh, also lived uh, in big cities for some time, and I've learned a lot in, in being in all of these places, and I am very appreciative of the comprehensive work that uh, Just Recovery uh, for Simcoe Gray has done. Um, these are issues very close to my heart, and although not described in uh, in quite this same framework, um, very close to the heart of the NDP. I'm particularly concerned um, with the the way that we build our communities and the way that we preserve spaces. It's not just about green spaces, though those are very important. It's about protecting agricultural land and it's about preserving and building strong town centers um, so that people are not having to drive on these highways that the Tories are loving to build right now. Great, thanks very much, Keith. I should note that progressive conservative candidate Brian Saunderson uh, was invited and he has indicated that he is unable to attend due to a scheduling conflict. So now we'll move on to the, the rapid fire and I'm going to ask a series of questions and you're either going to give me a thumbs up, a thumbs down or a, if you're unsure. So the first question, do you support reinstatement of the Environmental Commissioner's Office of Ontario? It looks like we have three thumbs up all around. Do you support ranked ballots? We have two thumbs up from Alan and Ted and uh, unsure from Keith Nunn. Do you support implementing a wealth tax? All, all thumbs up, that's great. Do you support implementing a basic universal income? All three thumbs up. Do you support su raising the minimum wage? Again, we have unanimous uh, consent on the thumbs up. Will you raise supports for Ontario Works, uh, the Ontario Disability Support uh, Program above the poverty line and index those to inflation? Again, thumbs up. Will you support a moratorium on all new gravel mining approvals in Ontario? We have two thumbs up from Alan and Keith and a thumbs down from Ted. 
will you re reinstate Ontario's Child Advocate Office? Thumbs up all around. Will you strengthen the funding and mandates of conservation authorities? Again, thumbs up unanimously. Will you strengthen protection for endangered species and wetlands? Again, all thumbs up. Would you expand the green belt into the riding to further protect the Niagara Escarpment and Simcoe Gray's farmland? Again, all th thumbs up. Would you stop construction of the Bradford Bypass and other 400 series highways in the green belt? And again, all three are thumbs up. We now move on to the uh, more in-depth questions. Uh, for question number one, uh, and it looks like this goes to Alan first. Our water health from wetlands to Lake Simcoe groundwater is under increasing pressure from climate impacts as well as sprawl and aggregate. To protect it, it will require all levels of government to do more than it has historically done, including intervening on projects that are a direct threat. What are you going to do to protect our water systems? And we'll start with Alan. Excellent question. First of all, we've got to stop the sprawl, stop the sprawl and stop issuing more, more permits for aggregate mining. We need to double, like we were talking about, double the size of our green belt. And we're considering it, calling it the blue belt because it's about water. So we're doubling the size of the green belt and that goes quite a far away. And we're saying no to new highways. We don't need these highways over wetlands. We don't need these highways over farmlands. We have to restore Endangered Species Act. We have to restore and, um, and protect areas that are carbon sinks. And we have to take another look at these MZOs that allow for um, the government to override community decisions to protect areas. We need to put a slowdown on that because the exemption should be uh, just an exemption, not the rule. And of course, we need to work with our Indigenous uh, participants, our, our communities to, uh, to restore and protect almost 30% 30, 30 of our land. So yes, um, protecting water is a big deal. And we have to also learn how to use and uh, reallocate water systems. We can do a lot better with new technology. We can do a lot better with gray water systems so that we can stop the demand on water and we can stop big business demand on water. This is our shared resource and it's a shared life resource. These are our life systems. Without life systems, biodiversity collapses and then we collapse. So we need to do this. Oh, Alan, I think, I think you've just run out of time. Uh, for the next to respond to this question, uh, we'll move to uh, Ted Chrysler. Thank you. Uh, we're fortunate to have some provincially significant wetlands in our riding, and we must do everything possible to protect them. Sprawl is threatening our farmland and our wetlands. The Liberal government would do a variety of things. Firstly, clean up and reduce pollution in our rivers and lakes. We we're planning to designate 30% of land as protected areas by 2030, which is up from 10%. That would include wetlands in it. We take the equivalent of 500,000 cars off the road by planting 800 million new trees over the next eight years. We do plan to expand the green belt in consultation with farmers, with our local neighbors and indigenous communities and create five new provincial parks. We would reinstate the powers of the conservation authorities that Doug Ford stripped away, um, and we would repeal his harmful changes to conservation and environmental legislation. We'd scrap the proposed 413. And on the point about MZOs, they've let the Ford Conservatives rezone land without any public or environmental consultation. And this is a power that they've exploited more than 60 times, which has tripled the number in the 15 years prior to that. They've used MZOs to trample over local opposition and environmental concerns. <clears throat> we will scrap MZOs and replace them with a new rules-based measure limited to critical provincial projects only. And that would include things like new not-for-profit long-term care homes, affordable housing, or major employment developments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ted. Uh, and finally, Keith Nunn from the NDP. Yes, an NDP government would uh, significantly expand the green belt and uh, um, increase uh, water protection, clean up and um, protect wetlands. Apart from that, the MZOs, as um, 
my compatriots here have said they're uh, they've been used in a very destructive way their intent was to allow overriding unreasonable opposition but they've been used to override entirely reasonable um, environmental restrictions and that has to stop um, it's only serving a small few it's not protecting the mutual resources of the community in our wetlands so that needs to stop and will stop under an NDP government. The NDP would also institute um, an environmental youth core, um, which would put a lot more boots and hands on the ground, um, some good jobs for young people, and real work to directly clean up and help maintain our natural resources as they are now. Great, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, just a reminder that each of you has a uh, can can do a rebuttal. I guess I guess we'll do it. You can wave your hands, give me jazz hands. And uh, if anybody wants to re rebut for that question, uh, you would have two minutes if anyone uh, cares to offer anything more on that question. Otherwise, we'll move on to question, the next question. The International Panel on Climate Change has made it clear that swift and deep changes are needed to ensure a future livable planet, specifically around reducing fossil fuel infrastructure, preserving nature, changing land use and transportation patterns. How will your government rise to the challenge to avert a climate crisis as much as possible? And for this one, the, uh, we'll start with Keith. Thanks very much, Ian. So first off, we would uh, um, address um, carbon pricing immediately. Um, we would bring in a renewed cap and trade system that really puts the onus on the polluters in a strong way. Um, we would implement carbon pricing in such a way that it would be the impacts would be mitigated on uh, rural and northern communities for individuals so that they would not um, they would not pay the price for the necessary increase in carbon costing. Another important piece of this is to reduce our reliance. We've all rever referred to sprawl here, but one of the pieces this generates is a lot more pavement, a lot more road trips for things that are really unnecessary. It may be difficult to address the need for commuting to work, but one of the sad realities is that far too many people are having to get in their cars to go get milk, basic groceries, go get a coffee. And this is where we need to really strengthen our town centers, um, build that missing middle of housing in communities so that people can afford to live close to the things that they need every day. And that's gonna have a significant effect on um, our greenhouse gas emissions by reducing those discretionary trips that people would far rather do near their home in any event. Thank you, Keith. Next to answer the question is Alan Kuhn. All right, I can't stress this more. This is the most important election of our, our history. These issues are urgent. Climate change is there. It's affecting things as we speak. So we have to, we have a bold, very bold, but a very affordable and doable plan. We have to start reducing our dependency right away on fossil fuels and our dependency on fossil fuels and fossil fuels. And the best way to do that starting is to get people in electrified, electrified vehicles, electrified vehicles, electrified scooters, bikes, e-bikes, electrified trucks, electrified um, transit, and like Keith was saying, our communities, we can't design them with these monster, monster sprawl ideas. We need to start thinking again, re-envisioning a community that all our services are within 15 minutes so that we can access our school, our hospital, all these things within 15 minutes. So we're not driving down paved roads that have papered over our wetlands and our, our farmlands. We have to re-envision that. And there's a great way Another great way is reducing the emissions that are coming out of our houses by reducing the carbon footprint by uh, a huge uh, in infrastructure grant that we're allowing individuals to bring into their homes and allow to reduce the emissions by retrofits, heat pumps. There's a whole bunch of different things we can do ourselves. 45% of the climate footprint in Ontario can be handled ourselves. We can do this ourselves. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, Ted. 
Uh, thank you. The uh, climate emergency is happening now and is an existential threat to our existence. I'm deeply concerned that my son and children growing up now won't have a livable environment. Um, Ontario used to be a global leader in climate action, and then the Ford Conservatives happened and Ontario went backwards. All levels of government need to work together to address climate change. That's the first thing. A Liberal government would reestablish Ontario's leadership by cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 50% below 2005 levels by 2030. We'll implement Buck a Ride by cutting all public transit fares across the province to a dollar until January 2024. And some areas of our riding have little or no public transit, New Tecumseh in particular. I would work to assist New Tecumseh to establish a bus system, perhaps tying into the link service of Simcoe County that runs in the north end of the riding to Barrie. I already mentioned designating 30% of land as protected areas by 2030, expanding the green belt, planting new trees, creating five new provincial parks. Uh, the Liberals would also strengthen the requirements of the Conservatives' existing industrial carbon pricing system to ensure the biggest polluters do their part to meet our 50% reduction target. As well, a few other things would transition to a fully clean electricity supply, ban new natural gas plants and phase out our reliance on it, eliminate connection fees for rooftop solar charging panels, provide grants and interest-free loans to retrofit homes and buildings, update building codes to energy efficient and climate resilient standards, and make retrofits to schools, hospitals, and other public sector buildings. And both the Green and the NDP have mentioned the 15-minute community, and I'm a strong supporter of that. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Does anyone have a, a rebuttal or anything you'd like to add to their previous answer? Otherwise, I'll move on to the next question. How will you implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? And we'll start with Ted on this question. Thank you. Well, I start by recognizing that I come from a place of privilege as a white male, and I'm committed to listening and continuing to educate myself on issues relating to Indigenous peoples. I think it would be presumptuous for me to tell them what is needed. We need to listen to them and work together to promote healing and reconciliation between our peoples. Uh, more specifically, the Liberals are committed to implementing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action by working with and learning from Indigenous peoples and First Nations, being guided by the principles of self-determination, reciprocity, and mutual recognition of nationhood, Doug Ford and his conservatives scrapped the Minister of Indigenous Relations cabinet position, and we would uh, uh, reverse that by appointing a standalone Minister of Indigenous Reconciliation. We'd also make the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation a statutory holiday, uh, invest in First Nations public libraries and expand the curriculum in our schools so that our students learn about Indigenous culture and the historical realities of this nation. Um, we would ensure Indigenous child care needs are met and create 22,000 new homes for Indigenous families. We'll also work to remove systemic racism from institutions and make critical investments so that Indigenous communities have access to the same world-class health care, education and services that the rest of the people in Ontario have. We want to uh, get everyone access to safe, clean drinking water ending the need for boil water advisories, restore rivers, wetlands, and watersheds, and invest 25 million in Indigenous small businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Next to answer the question is Keith Nunn. Thanks very much, Ian. Uh, we would definitely immediately implement uh, the UNDRIP and as well work aggressively to implement the uh, calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and as well as the Commission on uh, Missing and Murdered Indigenous uh, Women. We would establish a Treaty Commission of Ontario that would independently and impartially help settle land claims quickly. We would act immediately to bring about justice for Grassy Narrows. This is a long-standing issue of mercury just the other side of Georgian Bay from us. And it's uh, far long past time for this to be dealt with and multiple governments have failed on this. We would address, uh, we would establish a provincial strategy to address the suicide crisis among First Nations communities. And we would create a for Indigenous by Indigenous housing strategy. There are many other things, but these are key ones I wanted to highlight. Thank you very much, Keith. Alan. I first need to recognize my responsibility. Um, I'm a child of first generation settlers that fled Europe because of war and poverty. 
And I have a responsibility to recognize this. I have a responsibility and I will commit to upholding indigenous rights to self-determination and to act with real respect to the treaty obligations. You know, my grandfather was working in his garden. Not only 500 meters away was a residential school. Now I'm learning this as an adult, but 500 meters away from where I had my happy place in my grandma's garden was the Mohawk Institute, which is now the Woodlands, uh, Woodlands Center. This is something we need to do personally and we need to do as a party. So of course, implement the United Nations Declaration of Rights on Indigenous Peoples, our call to action and truth. Establish true nation to nation relationships with Indigenous peoples, recognize First Nations right to self-determination and establish co-management stewardship model for the development of provincial resources with fair revenue share. First, recognize and integrate Indigenous laws and legal traditions in the negotiation and implementation process involved. Thank you very much, Alan. That's that's your time. I don't know whether anyone has. Would you, you could use your rebuttal, I guess, Alan, if you wanted to carry on. Essentially, okay. I'll use my my rebuttal, of course. Okay. So we would make the day. Can I continue on? Go ahead. Listen, you, have, you know, you have two minutes. I've got the. You know, we we have to make that a national day of truth and reconciliation. It needs to be a national day. Um, we need to restore funding for Indigenous curriculum programming, like it was said. We need to work with Indigenous educators and community leaders to develop a mandatory curriculum on colonialism and residential schools, treaties, and Indigenous histories. We need to work with the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation to identify, collect, and provide copies of all records relevant to the history and legacy of the residential school system in Ontario. And we need to reform child welfare and protect services to address the overrepresentation of Indigenous children in provincial care by ensuring Indigenous communities are served by Indigenous-led providers. Produce annual reports on the number and the proportion of Indigenous children who are in care. We have a lot of work to do and we need to start. Great, thank you very much, Alan. I don't know if any of the other candidates want to use their extra time. Otherwise, I'll move on to the next question. We continue to have too many citizens unhoused or with precarious housing. What measures would you take to ensure housing as a right? How would you pair this with efforts to make housing more affordable for all? And for this, the order starts with Alan. Perfect. Um, you know, we have three adult children at home and they look at me and they have no hope for the future. The hope that we had growing up the hope my grandparents had, they don't have the same hope. So we're gonna create immediately 182,000 deeply affordable homes. We're gonna tax 20% tax on owners of homes that own more than three homes and corporations to get this, this home out of people's speculation. We've gotta stop the speculation. We've also gotta stop blind bidding and we need to freeze urban boundaries so we can start looking at info. We can start looking at ways of developing homes within our city boundaries by allowing for triplexes, duplexes, tiny homes, different ways of living. This urban sprawl business with cookie cutter homes over farmland, we're planting homes on valuable farmland. It doesn't make sense. Climate wise, social wise, we need to be within this 15, centimeter, uh, 15, 15 minute uh, radius. We need to ensure communities are connected and all of our homes are sustainable. So housing, housing, it's, a, it's doable if they're affordable, connected, and of course, sustainable. But we first have to get that, our homes out of speculation. A home is for people and for families. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, the question next goes, uh, sorry. The question next goes to Ted. Thank you. Uh, everyone has basic needs and the right to have shelter, roof over your head is one of them. We'll work to establish housing as a fundamental human right in Ontario. 
We will double the pace of home building this year, keeping that pace until we have built 1.5 million homes, including deeply affordable homes. Liberal plan is to create a new Ontario Home Building Corporation to finance and build housing of all types, end the waitlist for social and supportive housing, and build affordable homes for first-time buyers. We plan to work together with municipal partners to end exclusionary zoning policies, allow homes with up to three units and two stories to be built in residential areas across the province, and also including uh, secondary and laneway suites. We will ban new non-resident ownership. We'll also tax empty homes and put a use it or lose it levy on speculators with service land and approved building permits. We'll bring back rent control all homes across Ontario and ensure all renters have smaller, more predictable rent increases. The number of people living in this riding with precarious rent is unbelievable. <clears throat> we will um, ensure that our local communities who know best when it comes to where and how to build more homes are engaged. We're gonna give them incentives to approve more housing by providing up to $300 million in new funding over five years. Uh, we'll fund new emergency shelter beds, and we're also going to allow interested municipalities to permit street voting, which lets single streets of residents, renters and owners vote to increase minimum housing allowances. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ted. Uh, and to Keith now. All right. Um, absolutely. Uh, this is one of the critical issues up there with climate change in this moment is just this housing crisis. Investors need to be driven out of this market. Um, they never should have been in, and uh, though they're not the first cause of the problem, they are significantly exacerbating it. Um, an NDP government um, would uh, bring in stronger uh, vacancy uh, taxes and would also immediately start working to increase the housing supply by uh, eliminating exclusionary zoning. This is a hard thing for municipalities to deal with. Um, often they're dealing with residents who don't want to change in this, who, um, and we're not talking about bringing condos into, um, or not condo towers into um, residential neighborhoods. We're talking about this missing middle housing that is so important and that we used to build and that people love and is in all sorts of city centers all over the place. We need to be building more of it. NDP government would also bring back online social housing construction, would build 100,000 new units of social housing and refurbish 260,000 units um, to extend their lifespan. We would, Is that uh, oh, sorry, Keith, go ahead. No, I was gonna say we would, uh, we would also implement a housing first strategy. So, the idea of that is to get people in housing rather than setting up artificial barriers that they need to meet with regards to a day. Oh, and that was your time, Keith. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, uh, there is a Q&A uh, feature. And if you have questions for the candidates following this series of questions, you can put them in that Q&A uh, and then they'll end up in the document that comes to me to ask at, at, after this round. If any of the candidates wish to use their rebuttal or extra time on this question, however, uh, just you want to give me a, a show of hands. Otherwise, oh, Keith, uh, you're going to use one of your rebuttal cards. Go ahead. Oh, if Keith is still on mute here. Yes, not so much a rebuttal, but as Alan did, just to add a couple extra points, uh, we strongly believe in rent control and not just for the current tenant, um, that uh, we would implement a plan that uh, you pay what the previous tenant paid, um, that, uh, you know, that would put an end to the rent eviction game that we have seen so much of uh, over the last few years. Okay. Thank you very much, Keith. On to the next question. 80% of our health outcomes are tied to the social determinants of health, such as income, housing, transportation, health of environment, food security, racism and discrimination, and access to education. What are your three main priorities to address the social determinants of health for everyone? And for this, we will start with Keith Nunn of the NDP. All right. We've, I'm not gonna say more about housing as we've already said, <laughs> said quite a bit on that. Um, an NDP government would immediately raise Ontario disability support rates um, by 20% in the first year and double them um, in the second year. And then index that um, 
so that um, people living on disability never fall into poverty again. The program for Ontario Works is not quite so aggressive um, as I would like, um, but definitely would see big improvements and a move to indexing there to help lift people out and provide more food security. With respect to um, barriers of racism um, and um, sorry, reading the question here and got, got a little Just sideways. Racism and discrimination. Yeah. Yes. So the NDP has a long history of uh, being strong in this area and uh, would continue to act on that. I'm afraid I'm not personally clear on the exact policies in this moment, but I think our track record uh, in this area speaks for itself. We would be adding mental health supports and uh, um, joining in with the, uh, the proposed um, drug benefits being added to uh, healthcare, uh, the national, uh, of our national healthcare strategy. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, next to answer the question is Alan Kuhn of the Green Party. Thank you. You know, income. We need to phase in basic income. And that's the first step to being uh, with our ODSP. We will double ODSP, straight up, double ODSP and um, increase Ontario Works rates so that people can start the process uh, we'll create affordable, connected, and sustainable communities with a diversity of housing solutions, all within 15 minutes, of course. Robust education healthcare, including mental health care. We'll build up to 60,000 permanent supportive housing units over the next decade through innovative partnerships with public and private and nonprofit housing organizations. With increased tree cover, access to trails and park systems, we'll have people the ability to access better sustainable food but people will access to green spaces better. Green spaces is a, is a way of prevention, a way of breathing. We can get people to breathe. Number two, we need more accessible access to healthcare, especially mental health care, because mental health is health. We'll be funding mental health care under OHIP so that it, there's, no, there's no question, it's health care. Um, mental health is health, creating a system of care that is accessible to people in the communities where they live. And we'll be creating a three digit number. If somebody has a mental health crisis, they can call the three digit number where someone's there 24 seven and there's a mobile team ready to go 24 seven. Oh, thank you very much, Alan, You're, that, that's your time. And on to Ted Chrysler of the Liberal Party. Uh, thank you. Uh, housing is one priority, and I addressed that in the prior question, similar to Keith. Uh, second priority is the environment. Uh, I have a stressful job, and for my own mental health, I connect with nature. I like to hike and bike and enjoy all the beautiful nature that we have in our riding. Lots of other people do the same thing. I also like to buy food direct from our farmers. Um, the environment has been under attack during the past four years of Doug Ford's conservative government. I've mentioned some of the measures a Liberal government would take regarding climate change, protecting our farmland, wetlands and forests, stopping the use of MZOs, Buckaride, etc. The third and final priority would be on education. Doug Ford cut the education budget by $1.3 billion last year. He's failed our students, our families and our educators. The Liberals have a robust education platform. We will cap class sizes at 20 in all grades, eliminate mandatory online learning and end academic streaming. We'll hire 10,000 more teachers. We'll cancel the proposed 413, invest that $10 billion into new schools and repairing schools. And this is critical in Cinco Gray, where we are severely underserved with schools. We will reinstate an optional grade 13 to help kids particularly affected over the past two years. We will end EQAO and replace it with a new assessment strategy developed with the participation of all stakeholders. We will also support students' mental health needs by hiring 1,000 mental health workers for kids across the province. We'll hire an additional special education worker for every school and update curriculum to add more Indigenous, French, diverse, and modern learning. I believe that. Well, thank you very much, Ted. That, that's your time. If anyone has uh, something they'd like to add or rebut, you can uh, maybe raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next question. Oh, Alan, go ahead. All right. I just wanted to finish. Two minutes. Two minutes. My third point, of course. 
uh, which I never got to because I just blather too much, but I really appreciate the time here. Immediate strike a task force to develop policies and initiatives that address the adverse effects of racism, homophobia, and transphobia on people's mental health and barriers that they face at accessing healthcare. So our healthcare system, we need to look at that through that lens. In our education system, we also need to look at that and ensure our education system identifies and is free from barriers and create a curriculum of equality, including informed decisions, anti-Black racism, 2SL, LGBTQIA plus prejudice, and all forms of discrimination across subject areas. Education, of course, is our most important thing for the future. So with these three things, I believe uh, we have a good strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. I don't know if anyone else wants to use their rebuttals. That's both of yours now, Alan, so you've, you've burned them. So for our final question of this round, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed, further revealed the racial, economic, and social inequalities in our society. How do you propose to address these inequalities? And we'll start with Ted Kreisler on this question. Thank you. Yes, the pandemic brought into sharp relief the income inequality in our province. Uh, some of the lowest paid workers were the ones who had to go to work every day. Grocery store clerks, warehouse delivery workers, personal support workers, etc. Um, the Liberals believe everyone deserves economic dignity. We will replace the minimum wage with a regional living wage starting at $16. We'll provide all Ontario workers with portable drug, dental and mental health services. We'll work with businesses to build toward a four day work week. And unlike Doug Ford, who cut paid sick days, we will provide all workers with 10 paid job protected sick days. <laughs> we'll scrap Doug Ford's unfair Bill 124, raise the personal support worker base pay to at least $25 an hour, and increase wa wages for all healthcare workers. Ontario Liberals know that too many barriers continue to exist for families accessing social assistance or, or other support programs. And Doug Ford's cuts have made things worse. We will increase ODSP by 20% over two years and Ontario works rates by 10% in our first year. We're gonna replace the current complex rate structure with an inflation protected flat rate. And we'll also bring back a basic income demonstration pilot. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Keith Nunn. Uh, the new democratic government would uh bring in a $20 minimum wage by 2026 that would uh, be reached in $1 a year increments so that business can easily plan for that. We would re-implement a basic income pilot project. We have a full suite of um, factors in healthcare to expand the entire environment. Healthcare is a significant cost and there are too many things that are not covered by OHIP right now. We would add back drug care, we would add dental, we would add mental health care. Sorry, I'm a... new at this. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you froze there for a moment, Keith. Are you, are you, are you, are you, have, you, have you finished? Uh, I think for the moment, okay. yes. Okay, thank you very much, Keith. Next up is Alan. Thank you. Um, it's a fresh start. We're going to re-energize climate action with good jobs. We're going to restore dignity for our elders. We're going to uphold our new respect for workers, especially PSWs, a raise in their wage to 25 bucks an hour. We're going to rebalance health care. We're going to re-envision community safety to protect Black, Indigenous, and racialized people. We're going to reimagine our cities and our neighborhoods again. We're going to support our local independent businesses. We're gonna protect our local food and our water, and we're gonna care for our children. And of course, take care of each other with a basic income guarantee. It's a great time to restart things because we've gone through this and together we can reemerge with better, a better Ontario with the Greens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. I don't know if anyone has uh, either Ted or Keith want to add something to your uh, response. Otherwise, I will move on to our uh, the next series because that concludes the preset questions portion of our meeting. Now we will be turning to questions submitted by the audience and I've been watching the Q&A and they've been coming in fast and furious. These questions have been vetted for relevance, decorum, and ability to 
be posed to all candidates. Each candidate will have one and a half minutes to respond to the three questions, or sorry, more than that, there's been some pre-submitted ones and then others, uh, to the questions that have been selected from the submitted audience questions. Candidates may use their rebuttal if they have any remaining. If you have any questions that were not answered here tonight, then I would encourage you to reach out to the candidates personally. And our first question is from Jill. Recently, the Niagara Escarpment Commission has approved a number of development proposals against staff recommendations, yet they are charged with a mandate to protect the escarpment. Given that the, United, the Niagara Escarpment is a UNESCO World Biosphere Reserve, what is your stance on proposals such as agricultural theme park attractions? And for this, I guess I will, I will start with Alan on this one. So any development that, that threatens water and farmland in, their, in our new green belt, in this big, large green belt, and has gone through and over the consent of the individual communities should be held into question. Okay, thank you, Alan. Keith? I'm not familiar with these specific proposals, but certainly any development that is not on lands already designated designated for development um, needs far more serious scrutiny than any politician is going to give it in a sitting of parliament. That's the whole purpose of having staff to look into these things. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that was done by the Stephen Harper conservatives many years ago was to gut the Navigable Waters Protection Act, which was a critical piece of legislation for protecting waterways of all kinds. And we've seen what's happened since then. Unfortunately, the federal liberals under uh, Justin Trudeau promised us to reinstate that and have done absolutely nothing on that file, which leaves it in the hands of the province. Um, absolutely, we need to protect water. We need to protect our natural and agricultural lands. Thank you, Keith. Ted. Uh, well, I think my Green and NDP counterparts have uh, replied to the question pretty robustly. And uh, I too believe that we need to preserve the escarpment um, we don't, we don't need to encourage further developments that are going to raise the forests or, uh, uh take wetlands uh, away from people that, uh, enjoy them. And I, I do not believe that we should be supporting these things. The, the Scarpman Commission is, of course, arm's length from the government. So, um, they do have a review process and, uh, we would hope that, perhaps through the, the processes that this, the Escarpment Commission has, that they would be able to review these types of decisions that have gone forward. And I would certainly advocate to, uh, to maintain the preservation of the Escarpment as is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our second uh, question from the audience from Bren. What are the candidates' positions on women's rights? And I will start with Keith on this question. Well, um, I'm amazed that we still have to have this conversation. It's quite depressing, in fact, um, that uh, women are still not being paid at parity with men. It's outrageous um, that we don't have full involvement of women in the political process. And some of that is because of the terrible misogynist behavior um, towards candidates. I mean, we all take a bit of a beating on the campaign trail and some of that's fair enough, but women are singled out quite frequently for very vicious attacks. And I've seen this uh, with some of my own family members. It's something that we need to vigorously address. Um, women are equal and important members of this society and the kind of denigration that that goes on is terrible even in the the even though we have legal protections it's something that we clearly have to put a lot more effort into thank you keith ted uh well i like keith uh sorry i like keith <laughs> But I, like Keith, uh, believe that uh, the fact that we're having this conversation is depressing. Um, you know, I, I can't advocate strongly enough to, for pro-choice. Um, it's really a woman's right. And 
we have to ensure the protection of those rights and we see them under attack elsewhere and uh, it, it's very upsetting. So there's other things that we're still far behind. We, we want to um, bring back the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act that Doug Ford gutted and uh, similar, similar types of legislation that would help women's economic equality. And uh, there's, there's just so many things that we need to focus on. I mean, the childcare issue, which will, will allow women to re-enter or enter the workforce, um, helps both parents, but primarily women. Um, all of all of those types of measures are things that the Liberals would would implement and uh, move forward on women's rights. Thank you, Ted. Alan. No, and a couple couple weeks ago, there was a debate held at the University of Toronto with our leaders. And of course, Doug Ford did not show up, and it was Equal Pay Day. It was that day in the year that that a woman had to work extra to make the same amount as a man. Again. I agree with my, uh, my colleagues here, we should not be having this conversation. But the fact is, social inequality and environmental inequality, inequality of all things is related. Social, by bringing our social inequality, by making things equal, we can tackle all the problems that we have. They're all related and we can do this together. Um, it's incredible, it's incredible that we're not equal in this, this day and age. So of course we need to fulfill all of our obligations so that we can make the playing field equal. But at the end of the day, it's a relationship. We need to show in our own lives how this works because this is the key, the key to social inequality and environmental inequality. It's together. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alan, and just a reminder, I guess to Ted and Keith, you do have uh, your rebuttals available at any point as we go through the audience questions. We're going to be doing these until about 10 to 2, and at which point you'll have your concluding remarks. We'll move on to question three from the audience. Uh, this is from Lori. Do any of the candidates have plans to change and strengthen the Ontario Safe Drinking Water Act? The OSDW has failed in Tottenham and leading to years of violations uh, who and where else is the act failing Ontarians? And I guess for this, I will start with uh, Ted. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. I'm aware of the water situation in Tottenham. I've had some uh, discussions with, with folks who live in Tottenham and have been experiencing this for years. I think what we need to do is, is review those Safe Drinking Water Act uh, requirements. Uh, take take a bit of a lens to them and see what might need to be strengthened there to ensure that everywhere in Ontario has the same type of access to safe drinking water and and uh, certainly to the required levels of any types of minerals or what have you that that might be in the water and um, there's also other um, um, things that could be done. Uh, we're going to be having the pipe finally get to Tottenham, but uh, it's taken a long time. And uh, once it gets there, if there's more developments that come on stream, the water could still degrade. So I think other solutions also should be looked at. And that's part of um, the jurisdiction of New Tecumseh, of course. But uh, as a provincial member of parliament, provincial parliament, I would, uh, you know, work with them, work with the communities to try and address some of the outstanding issues. Thank you. Thank you Ted. Uh, Alan. So the water has carcinogens in it, and that's how I understand it, but there's a little amount that you're allowed to have. But the water in our area, or in Tottenham, has a little bit higher amount. And I don't exactly know what the, the, the name is off by heart, but it's not clean water. Why isn't that not mandated? Not if there's a suggested, suggested level, but there's an actual, why aren't we mandating these levels properly out of a suggestion to a mandated level? The same thing, you know, uh, with the amount of, other things in the water. It's difficult. How come we're not, how come we don't have a, a, a system where everything's regulated and it needs to be, it needs to be clean, clean water. And of course, the new developments that are going to come won't um, 
that fresh clean water from Collingwood that's coming their way is going to be again dumped in. So the question is, we need clean water now. We need clean water now. Thank you, Alan. Keith. Um, the NDP would definitely strengthen clean water requirements. In fact, uh, going further than just legislation, uh, the NDP um, has a commitment to launch a provincial water strategy to ensure that every community has clean water. And through that, to put an end to these long-term uh, drinking water advisories that uh, though they plague Indigenous communities far more than, uh, than other communities, you know, as the case of Tottenham shows, you know, are still far too common across the province. So not just legislation, but a uh, provincial strategy to address this. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Our fourth question. My daughter has struggled to find housing and has been at risk of homelessness for the past two years. She works two jobs and employs eight people. How are you or your party going to address this? And we'll start with Alan. Stop sprawl. First off, stop sprawl. Stop these great big developments for cookie cutter homes, these mansions, and start looking at infill. Infill with different constellations of different kinds of homes, make things more dynamic in the city make, and, and in different rural areas, more dynamic. And the idea is within this 15 minute, this 15 minute range, so that all our services are with 15 minutes. We just need to reconfigure how a home is. And we can do that. Tiny homes, uh, triplexes, duplexes, these things have to start happening again. We have to take homes out of speculation. Speculations, what's driving the prices up in their homes, they're for people, they're for families, they're, they're homes. Thank you, Alan. Keith. Uh, speculation is definitely a big issue and it needs to stop. Unfortunately, it's not the whole issue. There is a supply problem and that's part of what created the speculation problem in the first place. Um, sprawl is not the way to do it, um, though we can't simply turn that off. Um, I strongly believe that there are developers who would be interested in building this missing middle housing um, if it were only allowed. And so putting an end to the exclusionary zoning that essentially means that in, in communities like every community in this riding, the only thing you're allowed to build without a great big battle at city council is a sprawling subdivision. And if all you need is a little apartment. It helps you not at all. And so we need this missing middle housing. So we need to put an end to the exclusionary zoning. And additionally, um, we need to start deliberately building as a government um, social housing again as well, not simply in city centers where traditionally that kind of thing has happened, but also in the surrounding communities. So people are not feeling driven to go to Toronto because they feel they have no choice. Thank you, Keith. Ted. I feel badly for your daughter, and this is not an uncommon story. I'm hearing it constantly going door to door, and it's very disturbing. Um, there's not enough rental in Simcoe Gray what you get for rental, you're paying $2,000 a month or more, and it's not the best type of rental. So that has to be um, a part of the solution. We need a lot more rental. As I mentioned, the, the Ontario um, Home Building Corporation be part of our liberal plan to um, in, in improve and increase housing, including rental. Um, but that's down the way. Unfortunately, with housing, there's no fast, simple solution. It, it's all going to take time. It's going to require working with municipalities, provincial and the federal level to try and address housing. It's a huge crisis that has grown over time and is simply getting worse. Uh, I know people can't afford to buy homes and they can't afford to rent homes in this riding. And that is very disturbing. They can't afford to work here because they can't afford to live here. And so we've got to find further solutions. And, and some of that is, as the other candidates have mentioned, infill and removing exclusionary zoning and ensuring that we're building within the existing boundaries of, of the towns and, and communities in Simcoe Gray so that we have sustainable communities as well. 
Thank you, Ted. Our next audience question. What is your proposal for transit investments locally? And we will start with Keith. This is a tough one. Um, because we have experienced so many years of sprawl, um, we have a community layout that is very difficult and expensive to serve with transit. At the same time, we badly need it. Um, the key things we need to do are to build this missing middle housing to intensify. And again, we're not talking about condo towers here. Nobody wants a condo tower in, in Tottenham or Cremor or any of these things, but it doesn't take much um, to significantly increase the density of an area such that it becomes very servable by transit. And there's no doubt that the road infrastructure is there to support regional bus services. We have a commitment to bring back the Ontario Northland, which obviously does not help this community, but um, it's that kind of service that can be brought online to provide um, inter-community transit um, so that it would be possible to get from Collingwood to Beaton to Cremor to New Lowell. Um, and that's the kind of development we need. We're, we're never going to have an inter-community, well, maybe not never, but we're not in the short run going to have an inter-community train here. That's not going to be a thing. Um, but we could have good inter-community bus service to allow us to visit and take advantage Oh, and that's that's your time, Keith. Thank you very much, Ted. Um, yes. So on transit, I did mention buck a ride. That applies to all transit in our riding, by the way. So it will be buck a ride, uh, which is immediately going to help affordability and should also increase ridership. Uh, we've been devastated through the pandemic with that. Um, and I also mentioned earlier that I would be happy to assist uh, New Tecumseh if they want to work to put together a bus system because there is no transit down in that part of the riding. And, and lots of people have mentioned to me that how are they supposed to get from A to B uh, within New Tecumseh and elsewhere in the riding. And I, I agree. And I think that's something that, that uh, we could look at. And I would be happy to assist with that. The other wrinkle is this is Simcoe Gray. And <laughs> too often Gray gets forgotten, but Town of the Blue Mountains, there's no easy way to get from Town of the Blue Mountains to Collingwood or Wasaga or anywhere else. So we definitely have to look at improving that and finding a way to work together across jurisdictions and municipalities so that seniors in particular can get from there to an appointment at uh, you know a doctor's office or a clinic or just go visit their family who may live elsewhere so there's lots of um, challenges and opportunities with with transit and uh, our liberal government would certainly be investing uh, money into supporting further transit again for sustainable communities Thank you very much, Ted. Alan. Well, to begin with, we need to establish a clean, affordable, accessible intercity electric bus service to connect all communities across the province, all communities across the province, ensuring connections in small rural communities and dedicated bus lanes. Again, like said, we need to fully fund the Northlander and we need to expand all day two-way go service to leave every 15 minutes during peak periods and every 30 minutes off peak, including weekend service and offer at least one express service each way during weekday peak periods. And we need to support regional fare integration and seamless travel between transit systems. Transit is key, key to a climate emergency. If we can get more people using transit we can get them out of their cars. So this is, this is a solution. It's not a problem. It's a solution to climate change. So we will do everything we can to get transit in all communities in Ontario. Thank you, Alan. Our next audience question, uh, and it's particularly uh, given what we've just gone through with the pandemic, it's, it's very relevant. What are your specific plans to ensure more elder care support in home to avoid the need for moving seniors into long-term care facilities. And for this, we'll start with Ted. Ted, if you want to. Yeah, I was having trouble with the unmute, sorry. <laughs> um, well, this is an area that's um, quite 
I'm quite passionate about. And uh, my dad went through long-term care and, you know, I would say that was an eye opener for the experience of that. That system doesn't work. It never did. And we need to, we need to replace it. And we want to replace it with a community care based model. And in addition to that, you have to have the seniors care to allow them to age at home. It's, it's, you know, hand in glove, those two systems. We're going to end for profit long term care with a target of 2028. We're going to, um, you know, find a fund, excuse me, 15,000 new assisted living homes. Um, we're going to help 400,000 more seniors uh, get home care with a $2 billion annual investment by 2026. Um, and, you know, there'll be better um, enforcement and inspections in long-term care homes as we move forward as well. So the community care model is about small communities and it's like living at home. So even if you're in a long-term care home, it is more akin to community. There's places in Denmark and the Netherlands, and that's the models that we're looking at that we want to follow because they're far better outcomes, health outcomes, happiness, everything. And also the people who work there are far um, more satisfied. So it's a win-win all around. Thank you, Ted. Alan. We have to realize, of course, that our elders suffered the most in this pandemic. And we need to honor our elders by everything that was said, by building non-for-profit long-term care and enabling people to age in place in their homes. We can support people around this so they have the dignity of living a long life without the indignity of being forced into situations where nobody wants to be. So we need to end privatization of long-term care and we need to fund, um, for example, we will build 55,000 long-term care beds by 2033, at least 96,000 by 2041 at the most. And we'll create more indigenous led long-term care homes and allocate a portion of the new beds to these homes. We need to be more accountable on how these, these are regulated. And we need to first off, ask people, what do they want? Do they wanna age in place? And how can we put the supports around that? Because aging in place, I think in, in, in your own home is the best solution right now before people have to move into long-term. So that's supporting our PSWs and all the workers that are in the system, giving them enough money to live and supporting them. PSWs suffered a lot through this pandemic they were frontline workers that went in, they went in and they suffered a lot of the problem. Oh, thank you very much, Alan, that's your time. Uh, Keith. Yes, uh, we would uh, prioritize home care uh, as uh, the leading strategy in elder care. I don't even like the phrase long-term care homes because the way this model has grown up, it's none of those things. It's not long-term care. The care is debatable, though that's not the fault of the PSWs, that's the fault of people who are running them. And they're certainly not like homes, they're way too big. That said, um, we would convert the existing system from private to nonprofit. Um, those, the nonprofit homes had significantly better outcomes during the pandemic. Um, but the pandemic didn't create a new situation. It simply shone a light on how bad things were beforehand and how much we were ignoring it. Um, we would build many new spaces and in that process, prioritize smaller facilities in neighborhoods, um, you know, a dozen or two dozen. Um, as Ted said, much more in the, uh, the Norwegian model who are doing really quite a great job on this right now. Um, we would provide um, direct grants to support family members who are doing care right now. This is one of the things that's not much talked about it is what family members are often giving up to keep their family members at home rather than to send them into these facilities. And we would as part of this, establish standards that require. Oh, thanks, Keith. That, that's your that's your time. Our next audience question: We must stop developing sorry, on environment. Can I, oh, sorry. Can I use a rebuttal? Absol absolutely, absolutely. Ted, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not rebutting anything, but uh, I just wanted to mention because um, a lot of the time, cost is raised, and um, 
in all the, the research and everything that I've, I've done and seen, my understanding is the community care based model, um, it's slightly more expensive to build it, but once it's running, it's the same uh, cost to maintain it. And again, the outcomes are so much better for our seniors. They're so much uh, better cared for, healthier, happier, that it's worth the investment to create these smaller based communities um, to have those outcomes for our seniors. And similarly with aging at home, the, the, they always, critics have always said that the cost is, is part of the problem, but you are saving so much by investing in home care um, and, and not having our seniors going into these awful warehouses that unfortunately exist at the moment, they're much happier at home. Their family can support them. They're supported by by amazing caregivers, PSWs, and and nurses, and um, the outcomes are just so much better. It, it's worth the cost, but it's actually not even necessarily more costly. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Keith, unless you wanted to have a rebuttal or add anything to your answer, I'll I'll move on to the next uh, question. Yeah, simply to add that. Absolutely. Home care will save money. One of the problems right now is that home care has been delivered largely by for-profit companies owned by these same big um, long-term care home companies who have no interest in this. They want to just keep those beds full. Um, and there's no need for them to fix things because there's always more people willing to fill a bed, no matter how bad it is in any given care home. Thank you, Keith. Our next question uh, from Lisa. We must stop development on environmentally sensitive lands. You all say you will protect the environment. I want to know how. And we'll start this with Alan. Great. <laughs> Conservation economy. How do we turn our environmentally protective lands, not turn it into profit, but how do we work with the land together with people so that we can provide economy? This is the, one of the great things that um, is happening out in the Haida Gwaii. The ability to look at a piece of land and to integrate it, but sustainably, it protects it by conservation economy. Other, other ways are just straight up protecting it as parks and straight up protecting it as no development zones, straight up by law, but to actually to integrate um, light tourism, to integrate um, ideas of, of great um, ways of using the land other than um, the old fashioned divide and conquer. What we need to do is, is work with the land as co-creators. And this way we can establish a long-term plan of protection. Thank you, Alan. Keith. There are a number of pieces, but a lot of it is a mind shift as much as anything else. We certainly need to maintain the commitments that have been recently made and even expand on them to directly protect significant amounts of our nat natural landscape. But as part of this, I mean, we spoke briefly about indigenous issues, but let's not forget whose land we live on here. And uh, there's a whole land back movement, which terrifies some people, but it's not really about, you know, throwing people out of their homes and giving it back to indigenous people. It's not about that at all. It's about how we share governance of this land, you know. It was not all signed over. This is something we need to figure out how to share in partnership with indigenous people. And increasingly, we need to look to them for leadership in this space. Also, I've referred to this a few times and others have, have touched on it as well. We need to strengthen the existing communities. Let's have strong towns that aren't spreading out. Let us build a livable, beautiful environment that we want to be in, rather than continually turning them into places we want to escape and then go sprawling all over the landscape again. Let's make the downtowns of our towns places we want to spend time. Thank you, Keith. Ted. 
Uh, thank you. I just want to, uh, can you reiterate the question? I want to make sure I'm answering the question. Absolutely. We must stop development on environmentally sensitive lands. You all say you will protect the environment and this individual would like to know how. Right. Okay. So particularly environmentally sensitive. So I, I've mentioned a few things that we specifically would do, like increasing from 10% to 30% the protected land in this province, um, extending the green belt. And I would be a very strong advocate for working with our, our farmers to protect our, some of our farmland and certainly some of our wetlands and forests and getting it designated as part of that uh, protected green belt or expanded green belt. Um, new provincial parks. And you know, you're know you probably aware of the Escarpment Corridor Alliance and the plans for Castle Glen. And there's some opportunity in that area to look at, you know, maybe that could be one of the new provincial parks in this province. And, uh, you know, I think that would be fantastic. That would be something that we could advocate for. And I would, as the local MPP, um, nature is, is critical. We do have to protect it. I mean, reinstituting the conservation authorities' powers is another way of doing that as well. And we would definitely do that. So th there's, there's many ways to come at this. The other sustainable community features that uh, both Alan and Keith have mentioned are, are critical too, because then we don't need to sprawl. If we're expanding our communities responsibly and ensuring that our small businesses are protected and supported in our towns, then that's a great outcome for everybody in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. And, and that sort of leads into what will probably be our final question of this uh, segment. What are your party's plans to help and support independent small business? And we will start with Keith. I'm going to go right back where I was. Uh, you know, one of the things that may be shocking for some people to realize is that a strip of small shops in the old center of a town is a far more significant driver of income for the community than these big box stores that want to set up on the edges of our community. You know, these big box stores do not bring in the same kind of tax revenue that a small, row of small shops do. An NDP government would absolutely focus on supporting small business operators to support their communities, make livable spaces. Small business makes the majority of jobs in this, this province. And so they deserve our strong attention, not just making big tax cuts for corporations and bailouts for this or that project. No, we need um, a streamlined, supportive infrastructure for small business. Thank you, Keith. Ted. Uh, several um, items in our platform that deal with small business. Firstly, um, for ones that have been hard hit by the pandemic, we're going to eliminate corporate taxes for those small businesses for two years. Um, if you want to incorporate a new business, we'll waive the incorporation fee. Uh, we're going to backstop loans to probably tens of thousands of small businesses as well to help them uh, uh, thrive. Uh, we're planning to fund programs to help small, medium-sized businesses go digital, which is critical in this day and age. Uh, we want to make investments into industries that have been really hard hit through the pandemic, such as tourism, music, culture, sports, uh, certainly some of which are in this riding. Uh, you don't have to go too far to, to hit something to do with tourism here. Um, and also the, uh, the restaurants that have been hard hit were proposing to eliminate the HST on prepared food for uh, amounts under $20. So that's a, a large increase, which will help encourage um, the, the people uh, to, to go back to restaurants and, and spend their money there as well. So th there's many things that we can do, and um, I'm sure there would be many more. And I'm, I'm a small business person, so I totally understand the angst. And we need to make sure that that part of our economy is set up to thrive because they're the drivers for employment and well-being. Thank you, Ted. Alan, you'll have the final say on this question. Can't we just imagine Main Street? Main Street is where it's at. Main Street is where our small businesses are. That's where independent small businesses show their individuality. They show themselves. It's a wonderful thing. It's environmentally sustainable because again, like he said, they're not big box stores that are traveling 
over farmland and over wetland. These are our main street stores. They're the drivers and hearts of our community. So of course we need to build proper housing to infill our, our communities so that people are within this 15 minute zone so they can access these stores. And of course, like Ted was saying, we need to support them, to support them out of the pandemic and we need to support them facing the barriers that they face. Uh, Black Indigenous lives need to, uh, there's barriers that we need to address in small business, but that's where it's at. It's in Main Street. That's where things are alive. That's where we can have festivals. We can make bike lanes. We can also take off the street and make the whole street a walkabout street like it is in Europe. Some of these streets are alive with markets and seasonal food and, and sustainable food. A realignment of Main Street is the realignment of individual small business. And this is where it's at. This is where life is. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. And, and, and thank you to the audience. I think we had uh, close, close to 25 or, or 30 questions. So that's, that's some great participation by our, our audience. Our final component is the closing remarks. Uh, they will each have two minutes. And we will start with Alan Kuhn of the Green Party. Great, I didn't have to even unmute myself. Listen, this is the most important election of our history. We are dealing with some very, very serious existential issues. Global climate change is there. Towns are burning up. As Greta Thunberg says, the world is on fire. We need to act now and there's an urgency, but it can be affordable, we can do things. The Green Party is going to offer an affordable, a doable way to crush climate change. We're also going to get people in affordable housing. We're going to get people connected with their communities again, re in Main Street. And of course, our health care. Mental health is health. A funded mental health system under OHIP will provide a lot more resources, easier access, and access to our rural areas immediately for people suffering with these things. So a vote for green, a vote for green is a vote for the future. Thank you very much for the time. And I really appreciate it. Great, thank you very much, Alan. Keith Nunn of the New Democratic Party. Thanks very much, Ian. Governments for too long have failed in their most basic responsibilities. We look around us and we see so much inaction on the climate, probably the existential crisis of our time. We see too little action on indigenous justice and touching on the lives of almost all of us. We see around us every day people who have nowhere affordable to live. We've had several questions about that today. We see massive food insecurity and unfortunately, for decades now, we've seen very little action on these files. Occasionally, a little chit chat during a campaign, but then in the end, we see too much handshaking with large corporate folks and a focus on the economy, which might be forgivable if it actually led to meaningful equality for people in the province, but mostly it seems to lead to increasing inequality. The NDP platform this time is comprehensive, it is costed, and it is working hard to address all of these basic issues of climate change, of housing, of inequality, and it is time that we meaningfully act on these issues. Our Tory friend is not here today, and it's pretty clear where the Tories in this province stand. The Liberals, no offense to my friend Ted, who seems like a lovely guy, but the Liberals have spent a lot of time in government too. These issues didn't just pop up in the last four years. I think it is time to give an NDP government a crack with our detailed platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, and finally, uh, the last word goes to Ted Kreisler of the Ontario Liberal Party. Uh, well, thank you to Just Recovery for organizing today's debate. That was great. Um, I think it really has highlighted some of the major issues that uh, across the province and, and in our riding that people are concerned about. 
And Ontarians have a choice. They have a choice between four more years of Doug Ford and his cuts to public services, increasing privatization and environmental destruction, or a liberal plan that puts the people of Ontario in their interests first. If elected as your MPP for Simcoe Gray, I pledge to listen and to work hard for our communities. I'm ready to fight to make life more affordable, to strengthen our health care and public education, to improve mental health supports, to protect our environment, and to advocate for aging Ontarians. This is an important election. Ontario is at a crossroads. On June 2nd, I would be pleased to have your vote as the Ontario Liberal candidate for MPP in Simcoe Gray. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ted. And thank you to all our candidates for sharing their time with us today. And thank you to our audience. I think at one point we had more than 80 participants on the line. So that's, that's great. Uh, in case anybody wants to contact any of the candidates, Margaret has posted their email addresses in the, uh, the chat function. We appreciate the amount of time and work that is in running a campaign and we wish you all the best. We hope that this discussion has helped voters across our writing to inform their choices. We appreciate that the, the decline of our environment and climate is distressing and frightening. However, we have the power to participate in democracy, to insist that the choices we make in the future support a livable planet and healthy communities. So we encourage each of you to vote and make sure that you also encourage others to vote as well. The advanced polls open on May 19th for those who want to vote without the crowds. And the official voting day is June the 2nd. And I believe if you go to Elections Ontario's website, they'll post the, uh, the locations of advanced polls. After June 2nd, I would urge you to continue to connect with your, whomever your future MPP is and hold them accountable to the promises they made here today and throughout the campaign. They cannot represent people adequately if they never hear from them. This video recording will be hosted on Just Recovery Simcoe's YouTube channel. We will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants of the link so you can share it with your network. And as I said before, if you didn't get your questions asked or answered, uh, if, and if you still have more questions, I encourage you to reach out to the candidates or ask them if they, uh, for them to come to your door. Again, thank you for, for everyone for your participation and have a great afternoon. <laughs>